Hi, my name is Claire Hopkins. I'm very delighted to be able to moderate the session on discussing the role of monoclonal antibodies in chronic rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps. Thank you. So we're going to be discussing really the indications for monoclonal antibodies in nasal polyposis, the limitations of the evidence that we have to date, and really how we're going to select our patients. So I think we're aware of some of the challenges that we face. Next slide, please. Uh, currently, our treatment is heavily reliant on corticosteroids, either topically or in systemic form. Although systemic steroids can be very effective, we all know that the duration of effect is very short-lived, and usually within three months of treatment, the effect is gone. Um, unfortunately, repeated doses is limited by the side effects. Surgery is often successful in relieving symptoms, but 20% of our patients will have another operation within five years. Now, the problem with our treatment is that we don't have other good options to offer our patients at the moment, and monoclonal antibodies potentially could be another source of treatment. The limitations for that is that the cost of the treatment that we have at the moment is actually relatively inexpensive in terms of prednisolone and surgery, and the direct costs, therefore, of polyps to our healthcare providers are quite difficult to establish. And so one of the challenges in introducing the monoclonals will be to try and bring in monoclonals to an appropriate group of patients who are most likely to benefit. So we're going to start with talking about dupilumab. So dupilumab has been developed by Sanofi. So dupilumab is a monoclonal antibody that blocks the IL-4 or alpha receptor. And it effectively blocks the actions of both IL-4 and IL-13, which we know are heavily involved in class switching to a type 2 response and IG production. Um, so they play a key role in the expression of allergic inflammation. And now I'd like to hand over to my colleagues from Alicos, who will talk about Sigli-8 antibodies. OK. So Alicos uh, was founded in uh, 2012. Uh, the company has four molecules in development. Two of them are already in the clinic. There are four clinical trials currently either ongoing or completed by the company. And one of our programs is uh, focused on nasal polyposis. The company is located in San Carlos, California, and uh, we have strong expertise in research and in antibody development uh, as well as clinical operations. Uh, the program in nasal polyps is based on the concept that polyps contain very large numbers of mast cells in them. But interestingly, the so-called eosinophilic polyps also have quite large numbers of mast cells in them. And in my, in my mind, actually, the percentage of mast cells that you see in nasal polyps is probably more impressive in the nasal polyps than the eosinophils, because these are rare, rare cells that we typically don't see in the tissues. And in polyps, you can see as much as 10% of the cells being uh, mast cells. Our antibodies have the ability to target both eosinophils and mast cells. Uh, the target that we're pursuing with our current program in nasal polyps is cyclicate. This is an, a receptor that is in the family of the antibo antibody receptor fa uh, receptors. Uh, the receptor is present only in three cells in the body, mast cells, eosinophils, and to a lesser degree in basophils. This receptor is present in, in, this, in, in these cells, and it, it has a very unique function. It has actually an inhibitory function. So when you engage the receptor, you actually inhibit these cells. And uh, that's uh, the rationale for, for using our antibody in nasal polyposis. So the antibody that we're moving forward in nasal polyposis is AK001. And this antibody binds to cyclicate. In the case of mast cells, it has the ability to inhibit the mast cell release of mediators. And in the case of eosinophils, when the antibody binds to activated eosinophils, it actually promotes a cell death. So we were able to eliminate eosinophils that have been previously activated. Now, one of the first things we wanted to do when we started this program was to ensure that the mast cells and the eosinophils that are present in nasal polyps express the target that we are pursuing. And uh, we got several uh, samples of tissues of nasal polyps. We stained them for cyclicate. And we found that uniformly, the mast cells and the eosinophils in these tissues express cyclicate. And they express it in 
high numbers and in a very constant way. So we knew that we had a, a viable target in the tissue that we wanted to address. I want to share with you some of the basic data that we did to prove or to show the activity of our antibody. And what I'm showing you in this slide is an animal model where we have used a humanized mouse model. We've introduced a human immune system into the mouse. Now we have human mast cells and human eosinophils in this mouse. This is important because mice don't express cyclicate. They express a different receptor. But having a humanized mouse model, we're able to study the target in human cells in an in vivo model. And what we've done in this model is we've sensitized the mouse uh, passively by giving the mouse specific IgE to an allergen. Then you can pretreat the animal with either a placebo or with our drug AK001. And then you can expose the animal in this case by introducing a little bit of allergen in the tissue, in the skin, and you can cause an allergic reaction in the skin. Now, the beauty of this project is that you can see the early and the late phase response, allergic response in the skin by looking at inflammation, swelling, and measurement of certain cytokines in the blood as well. In, 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 in the case of this animal model, as you can see in the graphs in the right, eh, whether you treat the animal before you sensitize the animal or after you sensitize the animal, but before you put the allergen, our antibody is able to prevent both the early and the late phase response. Now, the second experiment that we did is in the next slide. And here you can see we did a similar project, but now instead of just introducing a, a little bit of allergen in the skin, we actually gave a large dose of allergen systemically to induce anaphylaxis in the mice. Our antibody is able to prevent completely anaphylaxis in these animals. So if we introduce our antibody and we see that, that the animals that received our antibody don't develop symptoms of anaphylaxis, whereas the ones that received placebo had uh, severe anaphylaxis. So uh, uh, this data supports the, the, the idea of, of being able, to, uh, the, the idea that we are able to inhibit mast cells and we are also able to kill eosinophils in tissues. And uh, we decided, based on that, to conduct a clinical trial in nasal polyposis. Uh, the, 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 in, in order to do that, we conducted a phase one trial where we were able to demonstrate that the antibody has a very uh, amenable, uh, amenable uh, 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 PK and pharmacodynamic uh, uh, profile. We had an excellent safety profile during this clinical trial. We show that AK01 had activity at low doses and for extended periods of time. We saw reduction in the level of activated eosinophils, and we also saw a signal of activity uh, against mast cells by doing skin tests in these patients and showing that we can diminish the allergic response in these individuals. Then uh, from there, we moved to design a clinical trial in nasal polyposis. And in that trial, we're studying patients with moderate to severe nasal polyps. These patients are res re resistant to intranasal corticosteroids. The patients are being randomized to one of three groups. They will receive either a placebo, a low dose, or a high dose of AK01. The endpoints for this study are uh, the primary endpoint will be nasal polyp size, and the secondary endpoints are the, the classic nasal uh, uh, endpoints of symptoms, uh, we're looking at smell tests, and because many of these patients, as you already know, have asthma, we're looking at endpoints of asthma as well with this trial. It's a phase two trial. This study will enable us to decide how we should proceed in terms of designing a late phase development program for nasal polyposis. Thank you very much. Sure. Any questions from the panel on, on the two monoclonals we've discussed specifically, dupilumab or anticyclic 8? Claire, if I may start off, I would like to ask your opinion about the future positioning of biologicals versus surgical treatment of patients with nasal polyps, because that will be the key question for the future. We are all convinced that biologicals will have a major position in the treatment uh, algorithm of patients with chronic sinus disease, but the key question will be, of course, what is the best for the patient? Will it be surgery or will it be biological treatment? So what would you think as the way forward to answer that question? I think perhaps
perhaps that's something that we might come to more naturally a little bit later on, but I think that will be a key question. At the moment, surgery is seen as an endpoint for failure to respond for, to medical therapy. And I would hope that we can sort of put monoclonal antibodies within that pathway so surgery will still be an end result for those that haven't responded well. The key issue will be, of course, in terms of cost effectiveness, because I think our healthcare providers will probably only allow us to treat some of our patients with monoclonal antibodies. And the key will be whether we have the ability using biomarkers to predict those who are likely to fail from surgery before we, mm -hmm. that happens. Mm -hmm. And if we can do that, I think we can justify treating patients before multiple surgical failures for a selected mm -hmm. group of patients. And I think that would be the ideal. I don't think in an ideal world we should see monoclonals as an, anti, as an answer to people who have failed surgery. It would be nice to get to them before we get to that point. Um, we have seen in, in studies, which we did actually together in the whole of Europe, that about 25% uh, of patients we recruited in several hospitals had more than four surgeries at the time of investigation, and they were not at the end of their life. That means that we have a disease where surgery obviously is not the answer. Uh, in about a quarter of the patients with nasal polyps, at least, if not more. The problem with surgery is there is no standardized surgery. Surgery can mean a lot of different things. And that's the first. We have to understand that picking nasal polyps, to be exaggerated a little bit, is a different thing from a full house fess, uh, which, which might have a better long-term result. The, the point here really is um, we have to deal with the health authorities. We have to deal with the colleagues. We have to do it, deal with the patients. And I think, depending on the success of that treatment, uh, there might be totally different views. And I already have now patients who say, I don't want a surgery. I had one, I had two, I don't want another one. Um, or I did hear about surgery and I do want to try something else, but also not the corticosteroid. There's a lot of corticosteroid phobia. On the side of the surgeon, to be very frank, there are also interests. How do you earn money? This, this is a point which we have to deal with. And I don't regret that part, by the way. Um, and from the side uh, of the health authorities, of course, it's, it's optimizing treatment for reasonable costs. So there are different um, ideas that we have to put together. And I would be very pleased if there would be a sort of an algorithm that we can recognize the, the, and identify the, the difficult to treat patients in the very beginning, maybe by biomarkers, and then see uh, that we treat them differently from the others. And I'm sure that there are patients who are off with a nice, with a good surgery, and others who have no chance to have that as a final answer. So I think before we go around the whole panel, I'd just like to take a step back and really sort of start perhaps a little bit more about where we are in terms of evidence, both for efficacy and safety. Now, we've heard about two monoclonals, but of course there are others on the market as well. In terms of where we are at the moment, do you think we have sufficient evidence for efficacy and safety to recommend the use of monoclonal antibodies for patients with nasal polyps? Can start with you, Vishka. I think we do. Um, at the moment, if, if we would be... Um, if, if we would have biologicals that were uh, cheap... Um, we would start prescribing now. Um, I think there are reasonably amount of safety data at the moment um, and efficacy data uh, comparable to systemic steroids. We all prescribe systemic steroids that are um, reasonable safe uh, as far as we know, but we don't even know for sure. Um, and if you compare that with biolog biologicals, um, I think there are enough data at the moment. The big problem is the economic issue. So, of course, we need more data and we will accumulate data in the coming years in larger groups of patients to be absolutely sure that the safe safety profile we see at the moment will remain over time in larger groups of patients. But I don't see that that will be that is not my big worry, the safety. But of course, at the moment, there is no indication for any of these monoclonal antibodies in nasal polyposis. 
What we can do at the moment to help that is if patients have comorbid asthma and severe comorbid asthma, yeah, yeah, but that's then a, we can that's get an them in the program. Issue. Yeah, but it's very hard to start a treatment without indication. I, I agree. I yeah. agree. So that's the first step, and I yeah. think that's very important that we have one, and probably, I hope, two or three to, to choose from for those patients. So that's number one. Uh, and of course, these antibodies are in different um, status. You know, we have antibodies where you're just starting, first trial. We have others where we have proof of concept. Um, and where we do phase three trials and, and publish those uh, actually in the next months, I hope. And that brings us nearer to that point mm -hmm. where there is registration for these drugs. In the field of asthma, they have been more advanced in Absolutely. bringing this to a higher level of evidence and even implementing the tre biological treatment in the care pathways. So, uh, but we are impressed as ENT surgeons that in the most difficult patients having nasal polyps and concomitant asthma, we reach not only control at the level of the uh, nasal polyps and sinus disease, but also at the level of asthma, which is a wonderful and major step forward because we know that the success of surgery in patients with concomitant asthma is lower than in the non-asthmatic ones. So I think uh, there is a huge potential there, but first uh, we need to get it uh, on the market, we need to get it registered, and we need to evaluate the cost effectivity of this, of this treatment. So we need to invest into that as well. So, so I've heard the term cost effectiveness come up a number of times already. And we also heard the statistic that a number of uh, patients have repeated surgeries. So in light of the fact that there are a number of patients that are continuing to have surgeries, and we do have a focus on cost effectiveness, when you look at the aspect of prevalence of uh, NP, nasal polyposis, are we, and I'm, this is a question for the, for the uh, clinicians on, on the panel, are we still scratching the surface in terms of the prevalence of NP? And, and where are we with, with prevalence? Because I can imagine that the burden in these patients that are having the repeated surgery is very significant. Yet when you look at the whole picture, do we have a good sense of how prevalent this, this disease is? And perhaps that will help in making the cost effectiveness argument when we look at the, the total burden of this disease in patients where perhaps it's not even being diagnosed appropriately. I think what you can read from the numbers, we know it's somewhere between 2 and 4% of the population, the adult population. But that doesn't tell us too much because out of these polyps, only, as I said, a subgroup uh, would actually need an antibody uh, because surgery has been tried, has not been successful. So maybe we talk about 1% of the population, of the adult population. Um, and again there, I mean, for me, the costs, although very important, are not the first point because really, if you have done three surgeries, what is your rationale to propose another one? If you have done several courses of oral steroids, okay, you can say, well, we'll risk the side effects to go on, but this is not the way I would think, not the way we would think as doctors. So there's something before we talk about costs, and that is just an ethical consideration. We have to add, we have to, to, uh, uh, to offer something to these patients, and I, I wouldn't know what else if there is not another solution. For me, this is really a, a great step forward in the way of being able to offer something to these patients who are otherwise untreatable for us, to be very honest. I think that's absolutely true. You know, we are here as clinicians to advocate for what is best for our patients. However, the healthcare providers will look at cost as the bottom line. And therefore, we have to think about <clears throat> that within the bigger picture. What sort of cost do you think would be tolerable by a healthcare provi provider to achieve reimbursement? Do you have any feel? Well, haven't you a nice institute in the UK measuring qualities and, and what, whatsoever? And then you put a certain price on that and you say, is that reasonable to do or not? It's, at the moment, it's very difficult because we don't really know the prices. Um, and we do not have the group of patients defined in which we want to do surgery. But again, my top, surgeon had, uh, my top patient had 30 surgeries in life. If you, cost, if you count these costs versus the cost of continuous treatment, you're about equivalent, probably. So um, if the patient group we are treating are those 
who cannot be helped by further surgery, I think that this um, cost effectiveness would be absolutely acceptable to those patients. If we say, um, you know, everybody who has not a neutrophilic polyp can be treated, then probably this would be quite an expensive treatment for a lot of those patients. So we need to, to, to know the, the parameters actually better. I think that in these chronic inflammatory allergic diseases, we, we, we see a common thread, a common theme, which is the, the need to justify the cost of the interventions because these diseases may not be perceived necessarily as life-threatening diseases such as cancer. No one argues whether we should pay for a Bastin in a patient with, with a malignancy. But we are here arguing whether the patients with nasal polyps should be treated more effectively. Uh, in my mind, uh, there is a need for better understanding of what is the true impact of the disease on the patients. Uh, in looking at studies of quality of life in patients with nasal polyposis, uh, the, the, the quality of life of these patients is probably as bad as the, the quality of life of a patient with quadruple bypass surgery. And yet we don't perceive this disease as a disease that impacts or the, the, the life as, as badly as cardiovascular disease does. So I think that that's an area where we need to work. Uh, it also, I find interesting that uh, uh, we've heard a few concepts here that come together. One of the concepts that you brought up, Peter, is that these patients that had comorbid asthma and nasal polyps improved. And what that is telling me is that the airway is one airway, and we're treating the airway, and patients are improving because you're treating the physiopathology of the disease. From a surgical perspective, I think you can remove the obstruction in the nose, and you can improve the symptoms of the patient very rapidly. But what the biologicals are trying to do is to actually impact the physiopathology of the disease, to go to the root cause of the problem and solve that problem. And in my mind, that's something very desirable. So following on from that, you know, we, we need to establish the burden of disease on our patients and how these drugs can impact on that. Question particularly to the pharmaceutical companies. In your trials, can you give us better endpoints that will evaluate that rather than simply looking at reduction in polyp size? I mean, you, you have shown us more endpoints than that, but we need to look at quality of life and patient symptom scores and costs of their treatment within these trials so we've got the evidence to take back to our healthcare providers. Is this something that you will expand on in future trials? Yes, so this is also a question we have for the panel. We are uh, developing clinical trials uh, with biologics. Um, one of the questions is there are no, uh, and the issues is that there is no uh, standard or validated endpoint in this disease. So in your opinion, what are the most uh, uh, relevant uh, outcomes to evaluate in this disease as we uh, conduct clinical trials? What will be the most helpful endpoints for the future evaluation of this disease? Lida, in, in your trial, which is on dupilumab, you already did some of these um, um, uh, parameters. You, you, you looked at SNOT22, which is quality of life, which is actually validated. And the, the effect on SNOT22 is, in my eyes, really impressive. It's not just, you know, 20, 30% reduction. Of, it's, it's a 50, 60% change. So uh, in that sense, I would say, yes, of course, quality of life. Um, uh, work performance. Also, uh, I think we looked at uh, days missing from work. These are things that are very important. The question is um, whether they can convince uh, people because at the moment, and we saw that a little bit here in the discussion, it's immediately on the costs. And I think it should be a bit broader than just costs. It's, it's life, quality of life, it's performance, being able to still work, to contribute to the society instead of just looking at costs. So I think there are instruments, uh, work and productivity index, uh, quality of life, um, days of presenteeism, uh, absenteeism and others uh, that we can use and that we should um, uh, integrate in the, into these trials. Although, of course, the, these are um, registration trials, so 
the health uh, authorities will tell you exactly what they need to figure out whether that drug is effective, and that's polyp score and symptoms. If we look a little bit further than having something registered at the FDA or EMEA, that it's very important that together we try to do these trials actually showing efficacy uh, or effect in uh, the things we know hamper our patients, huh? the, the tiredness, the loss of productivity, the presentism at work, because that will, at the end, and it will be difficult uh, to, to convey to, to the health authorities and to insurance companies that that eventually is, is a very expensive uh, loss that we have at the moment at our patients. And at the moment, as long as we keep measuring slots, uh, how important they are, it's all within the disease. And at the end, we will need general measurements of quality of life and activity to, to, be, a, to be able to convince people to pay for it. And I, and I think they are underdeveloped at the moment, and it's a task for all of us to do that. I couldn't agree more with you, Witzke, that we need more tools than just the quality of life measurements because quality of life is now a bit old-fashioned. Yeah. Nowadays, we consider more the level of control of disease as an important tool for evaluating the success of treatment and the subjective perception of a patient of a disease being under control by any type of treatment. could be surgery, could be biological treatment, or any type of treatment. And we, as a scientific community, thanks to the EPOS initiative, have already proposed criteria for defining the level of control in patients with chronic rhinosinusitis, which is, according to my opinion, a major step forward. Yeah, I agree. I think combining that, what is needed to achieve a reasonable quality of life is absolutely critical. So level of medical treatment and need for surgery is an important outcome because we can show reduced costs. But I think we underestimate the indirect cost to the patient as well. So I think it's absolutely key that we get the absenteeism, presenteeism factored into so, our outcomes. Yeah. Although we, uh, we assess these uh, endpoints in our clinical trials, these are still standardized clinical trials. What about cohorts in Europe, larger, bigger cohorts that will evaluate in a prospective way the quality of life, the effect on productivity? Uh, there have been cohorts in the past, like Galen, but uh, I don't know whether we really evaluated the productivity uh, impact in, in these cohorts. So is there any initiative? or an intent to do this in the future? There's, there's certainly a need for more data on, on indirect and direct costs. And we're doing some work funded by the NIHR in the UK looking at that at the moment. So hopefully there will be more, more data and I think we're all trying to drive that research agenda forward, but it's difficult. And well, any thoughts but on that? I think I like uh, very much is that that study so far is concentrating on nasal polyps. We all know that there are other uh, monoclonal antibody, I am not allowed to prescribe as an ENT doctor. I have to refer to my pneumologist who then prescribes that for asthma. And I am not allowed to do so. So if the license on the long term will be uh, received for treatment of nasal polyposis, I think I will be able to recruit at least a smaller group of patients I can follow up. And then we can think about a larger study about long-term follow-up and evaluate all these issues we have been mentioning and, uh, and then convince our payers, we call them payers, um, to uh, accept that perhaps uh, medical treatment of polyposis on the long-term is at least as valuable as steroids plus minor surgery uh, with uh, less side effects. Uh, and if we uh, can show that um, the uh, side effects are smaller or lower with a uh, biological uh, treatment compared to what we are doing right now. Uh, that is already an advantage uh, for the patient, and uh, we can calculate all the uh, costs of, uh, of the uh, days uh, people are uh, absent from work and uh, feeling ill, and, and, and I think that that would be uh, the, the long-term study we would need uh, to show our payers on healthcare uh, insurances that that is the way to go. We had a situation here just two, three weeks ago in Belgium where the health minister declared that topical corticosteroids are not reimbursed for patients anymore. 
Um, that means, especially for that group of patients, which probably was forgotten because it was about allergic rhinitis, that this group of patients would have to treat and pace themselves double dose of topical steroids for 40, 50 years because it's a chronic disease. The point thereafter is, is they count on, they have certain um, categories of diseases like cancer, HIV, um, Alzheimer. These are top diseases that you need to reimburse. And nasal and sinus disease probably is somewhere on the list much, much lower. So the, the thing is that the, the single arguments for a specific disease is important, but what we need is to really make understand the suffering from that kind of disease in general, to differentiate it from other nasal disease, sorry to say for those with allergic rhinitis, but this is really much, much more burden uh, on these patients than for other diseases. And because that is not done yet, I think that's the prim primary thing we should try to do. I couldn't agree more with Klaus, but what is important as well to convince the payers about uh, the importance of this of chronic rhinosinusitis with exactly. nasal polyps is actually yeah. the fact that it occurs in the population that is important Working. from a socioeconomic point of view. Yes. Whereas the other diseases that you mentioned, the majority of the patients are within the elderly group of patients mm -hmm. where the socioeconomic impact of the chronic disease is not as high. Mm. That's right. That's a good point. I, I think that the, 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 the need to, uh, to acquire more information that can support uh, the, the treatment of patients with nasal polyps is something I'm hearing here that is necessary. This is the kind of initiative that I think would be best achieved with a co collaboration between academia and industry. We've, we've done this in the past for other diseases. In the case of asthma, and most of what we know about severe asthma is based on a collaboration of industry and academia doing a large cohort of severe asthmatic patients that was followed for, for multiple years. And I think that this is the kind of work that can be done collaboratively between industry and academia where you could gather data. I think it's more complicated than just looking at absenteeism. I mean, if you think about it, if you're treating your patients with a couple of courses of oral corticosteroids a year, you can anticipate that there will be fractures down the run line a few years from now. And so you have to do one mathematical modeling of health utilization, not only for the years where you are following the disease, but rather for the impact that those that, that treatment is going to have long term on the patient. And I think that uh, 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 the health economics uh, experts can really help design the type of registry that you need to establish that could give you the data that you need to support treatment for these patients. And I would just add to that, I think that clearly the need for uh, collaboration between academia and industry is there, but I would add one more player and that's government. And you mentioned, uh, I think Lita rightly mentioned that the, the struggle we often have in pharma of what's you know, needed on the clinician side with the patients, but what the agencies are asking for us mm. from us on the, on the regulatory side. And sometimes those don't go together when they really should. And I think a great example of, of really uh, academia, industry, and government working together within uh, the respiratory, upper respiratory, I'm sorry, lower respiratory space, uh, specifically for COPD, is something called the Exact Pro, which was a tool that was developed as a collaborative uh, uh, effort across all three of those. And I think it really serves as a great example of, of the fact that when we look at where defining COPD exacerbations was a decade ago versus where it is now, things have really evolved. And part of that is due to the collaboration that, that, that everybody realized was needed to be able to move things forward. And perhaps it's a good example for nasal polyposis as well. So if I, mean, I, sorry to interrupt. If I can just sort of move on, because I think we're going to run short of time. Assuming that we have addressed the cost effectiveness issue and we have the ability to prescribe these monoclonals to our patients, can I just go around the group and ask for your opinion on who you think should benefit? At how we will identify those patients, and as Peter said, at what point in their treatment pathway should we be offering patients monoclonals, if we can identify the group that will benefit? Well, 
We're currently working on, on something we call endotyping of patients. That means we try to understand the pattern mechanisms driving it. Um, uh, luckily, these endotypes are actually also linked to severity of disease. They will predict which one, which of these patients will have recurrence, which of these patients are at risk of developing, developing asthma or have asthma. Sometimes the asthma also comes first. Um, so that's one part, uh, and we're currently looking in a, in, a, in a big cohort into markers in the blood. We have sensitivity specificity problems at the moment, not 90%, a little bit lower, uh, but these hopefully can be overcome with other markers. So my, it's a proposal, but it's uh, uh, more a dream at the moment, is that we recognize these patients very early and we can sort of get those out where, who will, by you know, a, a large uh, likelihood, uh, really end up with recurrent surgery and, and asthma. And if that is a possibility, then I think we should approach this group of patients based on bio, uh, biomarkers rather than wait until they have five surgeries and then decide to treat them. And from the pharmaceutical side, is that where you see these in the market? So I think that you address the, the, the issue that is key, which is for me is, is, is really understanding which patients uh, are more likely to benefit from which therapy. So I think that we need to do more research to understand uh, really who are the patients best suited to be treated with each of the biologicals that may be coming on board. And, and uh, in my mind, biomarker uh, research will be essential for this, for this purpose. And uh, it, the bottom line is medicine is becoming more personalized. And when it becomes personalized, it also becomes expensive. So we have to figure out a way to personalize medicine at a reasonable cost. But the long-hanging fruit of medicine is gone, and if we really want to help our patients, we'll need to accept the fact that we need to personalize medicine and that we will need to be able to select the right patient for the right drug. I'm really glad you bring up the issue of personalized medicine and endotype-driven treatment, as mentioned by Klaus or biomarkers being able to predict the treatment success are key. And actually all of us being here today, we believe that personalized medicine is important, but we go a bit further even. We go to precision medicine and personalized approach is only one part of the uh, spectrum. We do believe that participation of the patient is also very important. So the patient should be an active partner in the treatment process and also in the decision-making process of the therapeutic plan. And there actually we have uh, the duty to inform the patient about the different uh, therapeutic options in the future. And we hope uh, to be able to offer the patient either the choice of surgery or the choice of biological treatment in time. Do you see a point in time where we have a recipe book of different monoclonals and for some patients just a spray and for some surgery where we can get a blood test and we can point them all in a different direction? I, I definitely think that's feasible. You know, if, if I see what we achieved in the last 10 years from hardly understanding uh, what a polyp was, what was the relevant inflammation, how we could further endotype our patients to what we have achieved now. If we will make the same progress in the next 10 years, um, I think in, we, we, will, we will still be uh, uh, working huh? uh, and actually have that, that we much more precise and early. I, I can't agree more with Klaus how important it is. Uh, and also your studies, of course, have shown that if we intervene early, and I'm convinced that if we can intervene in the inflammatory process and not by surgery uh, in the disease, that we can prevent asthma to develop. Um, and that, um, so I, I, I really think in a period of about 10 years, we will be able to uh, endotype at least part of our patients, and for the moment that is probably the most important. We don't have to be able to endotype 90%. If we can endotype the, the proportion that really needs early aggressive intervention 
uh, that's most important because that are the patients that develop the severe disease that are expensive for our community and are in need of better treatment. So yes, we go to that recipe book, I'm sure. Closing question. Do you see the end of surgery for nasal polyps in the future? Will there still be a place? I'm not sure about that. Uh, it's not uh, wishing, uh, but uh, I can think about a strong reduction in the number of surgeries. So uh, some patients will probably need to create a little bit of space to be able to uh, topical uh, treatments plus reduction of uh, the inflammatory phase uh, during, uh, for, uh, uh, based on, on other drugs, biological or whatever is coming up in the future. But I think the number of uh, surgeries will decrease for sure. Yeah. I, don't, I think in 20 years we will not have surgery anymore for polyps. What do you think, Klaus? I think surgery is a is a suboptimal treatment of an inflammatory disease where we do not really change something and that as soon as we have better treatment we, we now see already yeah, with uh, biologicals in patients in trials we see patients where polyps have gone are gone for years so if that's possible now in a limited group that will be and uh, that group will vastly expand and nobody knows whether it will be 10 or 20 or 30 years but i think there will be an end on surgery i think we should exactly do the same for the biologics and the surgery at the moment we we call it surgery but what does it mean yeah. it can be very different in in mm -hmm. who does also who does what mm -hmm. so we should endotype the patients and we will find a group of nasal poly patients which is clearly nicely off with surgery, but with the right kind of surgery. Again, on that area, we have to work a lot to figure out how much we have to do, what is the principle of these surgeries versus chronic rhinosinusitis without nasal polyps. And I'm sure there's a group of patients where we still do surgery because, I mean, that would be one event versus a long-term treatment because so far we don't have a treatment where we say in, after three years we can stop and the, and the disease is healed. That's not the case yet, to my knowledge. So if that would come, that would be a different thing, but I'm afraid not. So I think we will have to re-sort the patients to optimal treatment, yeah. and for that, um, in both areas, there's more research needed. I think there is also more research needed, as we were talking before the start, about potential side effects. You mentioned the fracture as the most complicated one, but there are many others from long-term and repeated steroid uh, treatments, and there is nothing published about it. No. And we were believing the pneumologist, as you mentioned, and there is nothing published about two or three uh, 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 causes of uh, oral steroids and nobody knows what's going to happen. So in order to uh, to wait it up a little bit what, what's happening with that, we should create a study group or working group about that and check what's happening there. Well, that's what you said, eh? that we really need cohorts, um, big European long-term cohorts to, to well, there are now too many questions that are not that difficult to answer, that we can't answer because we do not know what happens to our patients over time. We started with cohorts and I can say that we will have results about the natural course, about uh, quality of life and impairment of quality of life in these patients and it would be great to build up on that but these cohorts are expensive and that's where I come back to your offer of cooperation. I think that's very much appreciated. It's, it's, as, simple, it's as simple as that. <laughs> Research also costs money. In terms of disease classification, do you think that there is a need for staging nasal polyps? You mentioned that maybe in 20 years, 30 years, there will be no more surgery. It was the case for oncology previously as well. Mm -hmm. People many decades ago, they did surgery and then with uh, systemic treatments, they applied uh, chemotherapies and other systemic treatments. Mm -hmm. And here, the nasal polyposis, I, do you foresee the, uh, also a kind of staging 
of the disease where you have at the early stage, maybe you have a local disease and then you consider it differently, then you have a patient that have clearly a systemic inflammatory um, I think we need to understand the natural course of disease mm. better, and that is not only linked to the phenotype, but also the endotype. And there is a huge task for the academic community in the field of rhinology in Europe and elsewhere to define really the endotype that is associated with the severe disease, allowing us to predict the natural course and also the success of treatment. But at this moment, we are not there yet. Yeah, I agree. I think. Staging implies that there is a natural progression through all of the stages, and I don't think that's what we're talking about in polyps. It's selecting a group of patients within the wider cohort who will have severe disease almost from the outset and are likely to benefit, whereas the other group with mild disease may not ever progress to the very severe endpoints that we see, and it's identifying those with biomarkers that will be crucial. This idea that it starts with polyps and then you have asthma, that's a wrong idea. It can start with asthma, maybe just because the nasal polyps are not diagnosed, because nobody looked into the nose. And uh, so uh, I think it is a separate disease. It's a late onset disease, mostly of the 35, 40 year old adults starting in that age. Also the asthma is different from normal asthma, from, from uh, early onset asthma uh, mostly being a topic. Um, but it's in my impression, it starts as a systemic disease in most of the patients. It's not a local process unless we are lucky in a, in a small population that we could interfere really very early and then prevent all the rest. But I think in most of the patients that probably is not the, ca not the case. So what, one of the aspects that just comes to my mind is we've talked about several concepts and it seems to me that if what will happen is that the therapy of nasal polyps will evolve over time, it will be very important to anticipate this and uh, promote in the field of rhinology education towards better understanding of the inflammatory process and the approach to inflammation by the experts because in my mind, if you, if you I was very seduced by the idea of trying to be a surgeon once because I wouldn't have had to understand the molecules that I had to put up with in <laughs> immunology. And I wonder if, if this will be something that will you, the leaders of rhinology, will need to promote in the curriculum of education of the rhinologists, uh, uh, the better understanding of inflammatory process. Yes, I think we will have to embrace the medical yeah. and the surgical strategies with, yeah. with an open mind. I think, unfortunately, although we could discuss this all morning, I think we, we're running out of time. Um, so I think what's absolutely clear is there's huge potential from the monoclonal antibodies, but there is a need for us to collaborate together, both to show the burden of disease and the burden of the treatments that we offer our patients and to establish really the best group of patients who are likely to benefit from the treatments. Thank you very much for your time. I think we need to stop. Thank you. Thank you.